So what I have here is actually the 240 AIO that I purchased off of Amazon for the Expanse PC that I ended up not using. And uh, I threw it in the inventory and I was like, what am I gonna do with this? And then I looked at the box because I really didn't. My search criteria was nothing more than what is basic, to be honest. And I wanted something basic without needing controllers and stuff. But then when I looked at the box and saw that this has anti-leak tech inside, I figured this is probably worth a closer look. The Air 903 Max Mid Tower case from Montec features a 51% porosity ventilation rate, pre installed HP 140mm ARGB fans, and 21 built in RGB modes for a premium feel without the premium price. Not interested in RGB? Then the Air 903 base is just for you with its clean aesthetic and incredible component support at a price that won't have you crying. To see the full list of Air 903 specs from Montec, follow the link in the description below. All right, so a couple of tech spec stuff. This does fit pretty much any socket that's available today. Uh, LGA 1151, 1150, 1155, 211-V3, or 2011-V3, 2011, 1700, 1200, and then all the AMD stuff, including STRX4, which I probably wouldn't recommend unless it's got a big enough cold plate. Uh, AM5 and AM4, typical stuff, 4.56 watt pump. Uh, it's uh, RPMs for the fans between 500 and 1600. Airflow is 60.85 CFM. I'm wondering if that's combined both fans because <laughs> that seems kind of high. Uh, anyway, it's a four pin PWM and that was one of the things that I cared most about. And then fluid dynamic bearing, all the usual crap. So, but what caught my attention is the fact that this, with the anti-leak tech, I'm like, what does this mean anti-leak? Well, typically what leaks in an AIO? Well, Short of any sort of a mechanical connection failure that could happen anywhere tubes meet a fitting or something like that, especially if you're bending them out of the way or you're moving them around a lot, things can happen. Things plastic can get cracked or whatever. But the approach that Deep Cool is using here is specifically about pressure based leaks or bursting, if you will. Now, I find this to be kind of interesting that they would choose this sort of reason uh, to call it quote unquote anti leak. Because short of an experiment I did, so a while back when Nick first started working for me and we were in much dip, the old, old studio, the way fittings and hoses can pop off, especially in a hard tube or soft tube, doesn't matter, is as the temperature or the fluid temperature inside the loop rises, it expands. And as it expands, it's just like a radiator in a car, only that's a much bigger rise in temperature and pressure. But as the temperature rises, it starts to expand. If it expands past a certain point, a, a, a tube can pop off. Now, what I was doing was I took my thermal imaging camera and I was pointing it at the radiator. And so I was showing Nick how in a double pass rad, you'll see one side of the radiator be warm and the other side be much cooler than the other half because you can see it do a U shape. And I was sitting there using my heat gun to add heat to the loop. Well, I was actually warming up the radiator and there were no fans or anything on it. So it continued to get warmer and warmer and warmer until one of the tubes popped off. And it was such a geyser that the water actually hit the ceiling and was dripping off the ceiling. And Nick was literally looking like the Homer Simpson meme of not knowing what to do because he was, it was the noise that scared us both. I was not expecting it. Uh, so anyway, what this is designed to do is if the temperature is increased in, this, in the loop to a, a certain point, it has this sort of a bladder bag, if you will. Not to be confused with a colostomy bag. That is something very different. It's for your colostomies. But this has a, on the side of the radiator, a little piece that is, it's basically got a bag in there. That's the way they're describing it. That expands out to create a larger internal volume for the system. So as the system increases, that would increase with it increasing volume. So that would keep it from being a burst uh, hazard. Now. I can't remember the last time. See, this is, this is it right here. See, it's sort of built in. Um, does the other side have one? Nope. So it's just right there. But I'm wondering now if I hit this with a heat gun, will I see that expand? <laughs> kind of curious, to be honest. Um, anyway, before we do that, we gotta look at the rest of it. So this, it, it's a very solid feeling radiator. It's got a little retention clip to kind of keep it together. So that, keep it together, man. So that you're not uh, having tubes flailing around everywhere. It has an infinity mirror RGB right here. But yeah, what got my attention most about this was, well, the pump runs off a three pin header. And then obviously it's got ARGB. So this, I chose this pump, again, nothing to do with the bursts or the anti-leak built in. Um, 
It was just because it used standard connections. I didn't have to do anything crazy if I was gonna try and wire it up in the Expanse build. Their fans, I've never actually looked at their fans. And Deep Cool is a brand that started to get my attention over the last few months of just kind of coming out with some different stuff. What I mean is they're just not your normal run of the mill type of water cooling uh, AIOs, tower coolers, and heck, even cases. So if we look at their fans here, they're rubberized. Oh, wow, it's not just a rubber pad. It's like the whole thing is rubber. Like this whole piece right here is rubber. They do feel kind of lightweight though. Not cheap, but the cage and the frame feels lighter than a lot of other fans. So that might throw some people off, but it doesn't feel like poor quality. But as you can see, the fans are very square. So they'll seal up against each other nicely when they're sitting on the radiator. And I guess one other thing we can do is we can take a look at what the pump uh, looks like when it's powered on. I guess we'll just maybe go to one of our test benches and plug it in real quick. So you can see the infinity mirror effect. That's a cool looking, it's, it's like an infinity cube all. Okay, <laughs> it's like an infinity cube. It's all set to blue right now, like flickery blue. Um, the, the computer is anyway. So it's not just like a top down effect and I know it's all glary right now with the lighting. So the infinity cube part, as you can see, it's kind of neat. It looks like it looks like a Minecraft cube, technically. The Deep Cool logo is always going to shine that greenish, bluish color, I guess, because that's their logo color. So it's ignoring what the ARGB is telling it. So that color is probably always going to be this sort of a teal. In terms of the cold plate, you can see it's copper, exposed copper. You got the screws and the perimeter around it. I do. This does not look like it's an Asetek rebrand um, or an Asetek licensed product. I could be wrong, but this doesn't look like, look like Asetek, so it might be in-house. Um, Pre-applied thermal paste, as you can see. The reason why I'm pointing this out though, is when it comes to 13th gen and for sure TRX uh, or um, the Threadripper thread stuff, this is too small. So 13th gen though, I'm gonna grab a CPU real quick and hold the IHS up to it. I'm kind of curious as to if the IHS is gonna overlap on any of those screws. So this is a 13th gen, which 12th and 13th gen uses the same size. Um, it does look like the thermal paste will cover pretty much all of the IHS. It looks like it also barely fits within those screws, which is nice to see. Threadripper, I guaranteed, I guarantee will not fit and get full coverage with this. So don't use this for Threadripper. If you're still running a Threadripper system or an Epic CPU or something, get something designed specifically for that CPU. It is just so ridiculously big. Uh, it, th this is not gonna get the job done. Now, before we get to the temperature slash anti-leak testing portion of this, I wanna see what the installation bracketry and stuff looks like. So here's your back plate, whereas these screws are going to be adjustable width-wise. I'm sure that just pulls out. Yeah, see so these give you the oblong mount to be able to go along with the different Intel uh, offsets on the holes. Here is a fan splitter in case you need to split uh, your signal from your motherboard to your two fans right there. Interestingly enough, they give us what appears to be an inline voltage uh, re reducer to slow the fans down. So I haven't seen one of those in a long time. One of the things I hate most about many AIOs for AMD is they retain the clip, the little clip brackets, which are terrible. These do replace the uh, clip brackets and then these mount to the actual pump like this. And then they will mount directly to the back plates that are present on AM4 and AM5. Of course you have your standoffs and stuff that are designed for each particular socket type and they are labeled. So this is all the AMD stuff right here. This is all the Intel stuff right here. And then these are the hold down screws for once this goes through the motherboard, this is the caps that screw down and then hold the pump down onto the bracket. So with Intel, you're gonna use the, the bracket that it comes with because Intel doesn't have a bracket by default on a motherboard. AMD reuses AM4 and AM5 backplates. And then it looked like the manual showed like this. Yeah, it does just come off. It looked like it was just a magnetic piece and it is. So you can see all the diffused lighting in there, which is kind of crazy because it's just the infinity mirror. So only parts of it shine through but you can see how they have just this crazy looking array of LEDs shining in all different directions. So you get direct backlighting, which is how you're getting such a solid infinity mirror effect. 
NZXT's Build is a quick and easy way to get a new gaming computer. Build a gaming PC on your budget using the built-in configurator and see exactly how your favorite games will perform. Don't want to spec it yourself? Then choose from BLD's pre-configured player PC systems designed to fit your needs and budget. To see the full lineup and specs of the NZXT BLD Player Series pre-built PCs, follow the sponsored link in the description below. All right, now I want to test this. I've got the pump running right now. Um, it's super, super quiet once all the air bubbles have made their way to the highest end of the loop. Um, so I want the coolant circulating right now, but now I'm just gonna let my heat gun, I'm gonna go in more, one of the lower temps. Just start to warm up this loop. Cause I don't, I really don't see, I don't know, I, I, I think this has to expand in some way. It's a bag. I decided I need at least some point of data here to be able to determine uh, at least what's happening. So right now I've got my thermal couple attached to the cold plate and there is thermal paste on it, by the way, believe it or not, that, that helps anything that needs to be conducted uh, for temperature wise. So the pump is running right now and you can actually see uh, like the passive cooling that I've talked about. So the loop is very, very warm. Right now it's still at 42.3 C, thereabouts. There's gonna be some thermal loss right now trying to measure um, cause it's just taped down with thermal paste, but it gives us some indicator of what's happening. We would need like an actual inline temperature probe to see what the real actual temperatures are. But now we'll get an idea that if we do see it pop out or some sort of anti-leak function engage due to overpressurization, then we should at least get an idea of where that happens. In between shots right now when I tested it and it was fully hot when I plugged it all up to like put the probe and everything on, it was at 50 C. Now that's 50 C coolant, because remember we have the coolant going through the cold plate. So right now we have it sort of going in reverse the way that it normally would. So the cold plate, because it's touching the fluid, is gonna give us a very good indicator of the fluid temp. Now a lot of people very incorrectly deduce that if they have a CPU running at 65 C underwater, that that means the fluid is 65 C, and that's not true. If that were happening, you would no longer be taking away any more heat from the device. So the fluid temp, Typically in, in my loops at home, because I do have a, a temperature probe in mine. Uh, that sounds very dirty. When I'm gaming and I have my 4090 going like full tilt, I'll see the temperature get up to about 32 to 35 C, depending on the ambient temp in the room. Now that's 35 C with the GPU that's running like 45 C. So the fluid is always gonna be much, much, much colder than the component. So don't incorrectly think that if your CPU or your GPU is at whatever temp, that that means your fluid is too, because it's not. If it was, bad things are happening. If your fluid was this high already, very bad things would have had to have happened in your system because I'm trying to look at it very carefully to see if anything's happening. Like your pump has an operating temp max temperature as well. So we could very well be about to kill the pump just through temperature, but most water pumps and stuff like the DD, DDCs and all that and the Langston, I think they're like 60 C max temperature, somewhere around there. So I can't imagine this guy here. Oh, it's so hot. It's so hot. I feel like we might hit the temperature limit of the pump and the pump fail due to temp way before the pressure relief. What's 57 C in Fahrenheit? I wanna make sure I don't get scalded. <laughs> yeah, Phil's starting to move because you can absolutely get burned by this. <laughs> I, the pump is like barely turning. Like I firmly believe the pump. Oh, okay. The couple had come off the cold plate. <laughs> so, oh as soon, so as soon as I squeezed it back down, that's actually the internal temperature of the fluid right now. 72 C. What's 72 C in Fahrenheit? <laughs> All right, now here's what we're gonna do. Nothing burst. Well, that's a good sign, I guess. That nothing burst. Okay, well, we're now at normal like loop operating temps under load now, 32C. So I feel like the pump was probably also having to work against the pressure, obviously. Now it should still flow just fine, but the, the pump motor itself was probably too hot for its, it was probably well out of its operational uh, temperature range. And so that's why I was like, I, could, I couldn't really feel it moving. If I grab another random AIO and hit it, and it goes up to 71 degrees and nothing happened, which again is so far beyond the operational temperature you would, your system would ever create in a loop, does that make this pointless? So this is a Fantex Glacier 1. It's a 240 AIO, just a, this is an Ace Tech design. Uh, very similar setup. Obviously it doesn't have a 
a bag, an elastic band in a bag in there to push air out. So there's 75 degrees Celsius on the fluid right now. I believe the pump has failed at this point because it's not going up that hot. And I know that's hotter than 75 Celsius coming out of that heat gun. I feel like for safety reasons, I want to stop here. We're about to hit 80 C. Can you tell me when it hits 80? <laughs> I don't want to touch it. Ah, so hot. Okay, so as we just showed, with nothing special about this Asatec unit, right? The pump is still alive and running. You can hear that. It's running faster than it was at 80C or even 60C, but running nonetheless. It didn't kill it. And I, to be honest, I would have thought that running it at that temperature would have killed the pump, but it came back to life. I probably took some life off of the electronics, to be honest. That's besides the point. In terms of this feature, I think Deepcool is, is doing a good attempt at making people comfortable with the idea of water cooling. Because what's the number one reason people push back against water cooling? It's, it's water damage if something leaks. Now, I think the, the, the idea behind this is not that they're trying to stop a pipe from bursting off of your loop, which I've, I really wish I had the like, footage of that happening on our security camera when Literally, it was dripping off the ceiling. It I just held the heat gun on there for a long time, by the way. This time, I intentionally didn't heat it up too fast. However, I think what they're also trying to do is, is reduce the idea of there being any leakage at any of the connection points. So the connection points being clearly the pump and the radiator on an AIO. But I've never personally seen one fail there. I've, I've seen AIOs fail in a couple of different ways. The pump fails. The electronics in the Asatec ones, and this, they're really small. They, they're not great, to be honest, and they have a lifespan of usually just a few years. If you get five years out of an AIO, you've got your money's worth multiple times over. So the pump would fail, but then what happens? All mo modern motherboards and CPUs have a TJ Maxx and a thermal shutdown limit. So if your CPU was to start overheating and going through the roof, your telltale sign would be your system starts becoming very unresponsive, and then it probably just shuts down. Um, you might get a blue screen prior to that, because as temps go up, the CPU stability goes down as well. But that's not going to lead to damage. There's fail-safes built in for that. Uh, typically, where I see them leak, you want to know the truth, is from the O-rings underneath the cold plate. These start to fail in some way, and it starts to drip out of these edges, and then it can drip down onto your CPU socket or whatever, and then that's where bad things can happen. But most of the time, the AIOs do have an anti-corrosive uh, and a non-conductive fluid put in there. The problem is they're touching metals all day long, so they do pick up ions over time, which will add to their conductivity. So they may start as a non-conductive fluid. They become measurably conductive, depending on how long they've been running. Remember, they are touching aluminum and copper in most instances here with an anti-corrosive agent put in there. So I feel like Deepcool is, is making a solid effort at making people comfortable. I just don't think the thing they did is going to really fix a problem that exists. Maybe they have more RMA data to go off of than I do, but that might then be a deep cool problem and not a device industry wide problem. The other thing I want to do is how much did I pay for this? I forget already. Uh, so I paid $120 for it. Well, you know what? I'm willing to sacrifice $120 now to open this up and rip this out and see what it looks like. Okay. It's just a rubber... Huh. I don't know why I expected more. <laughs> to be honest, you know what? There is a thing in here. I don't believe it to be a... You saw there's not much volume it's adding to the loop. So the idea is as it compresses, it's adding internal volume because that, that mass is being reduced, right? So... Or volume is being reduced, not mass. Um, okay, well... Cool story, bro. I just don't think it's really all that necessary. But you know what? I, I, I also can't be that guy that's like, we need innovation. Well, that innovation's stupid. Which is what I feel like I'm saying, but I think it seems like a pretty decent AIO. I just, I can't trust it now because, I guess I can. I think it's still a fully usable AIO, personally. All right, guys, thanks for watching. First time I've done any sort of investigative science. There's nothing science about this. Investigative whatever, we, who's it you want to call it, into a, a device. So, all right guys, thanks for watching. As always, we'll see you in the next one.